everybody. I'm Jordan Ferranto, and I'm the Creative Arts Therapy Supervisor at Resilience here in Chicago. Today, I'm going to facilitate a conversation with some of my colleagues about sexual assault, the healing process, and the importance of creativity. Uh, so we are going to talk pretty in depth about the experience of sexual assault. So I just want to give everybody who's listening a content warning about that. And I invite you all to listen to the parts that you feel able to pause or walk away when you need to. Anything you need to care for yourself is always welcome and hopefully available to you. So in a moment, I'm going to allow my colleagues to introduce themselves. But first, I want to give you some information about our organization. Resilience is a nonprofit rape crisis center in Chicago. We have three locations, one in the Loop, one in Ravenswood, and one in the Austin neighborhood. We have been supporting survivors for over 40 years, and we offer a variety of services for survivors. Among our services are medical and legal advocacy, education and training, trauma therapy, and creative arts therapy services. We offer our services to survivors and their loved ones free of charge. For more information about what we do and who we are, go to our website, which is ourresilience.org. Today, I'll be speaking with my colleagues, Victoria, Lauren, and Valerie. So I'll allow them each to take uh, a moment to introduce themselves. And we can begin with Lauren Milburn. Um, I am a dance movement therapist and trauma therapist at Resilient. I am also a licensed counseling professional. I am really honored to be in this role at Resilient. As a dance movement therapist, I bring in a body-based understanding of a healing process. It's one of the creative arts therapies that falls under that umbrella and part of how I came into this work was actually really through my own healing process. I have always been a dancer, and my body has always been my refuge. I feel, again, extremely grateful for the fact that my body has been that for me and been there with me through everything that I have experienced in my life. And and really, by developing curiosity of my body and my creative process, I was thankfully able to find that this is something that could serve others as well. And I think it's particularly wonderful when working with trauma as as trauma is something that is completely impacted and felt through the body. Um, thanks, Lauren. I also want to follow up with Lauren's gratitude. Thank you so much, Jordan, for having us. I'm Victoria Herrera, and I'm actually... Uh, I graduated from the Art Institute, um, the art therapy program. My role at Resilience is I'm a bilingual trauma therapist slash art therapist. I also came into this work through my own healing. I really love storytelling and writing, and I really began my own process by beginning there and then dancing and painting, drawing, making ceramics. Something that I'm really passionate about is the kind of merging my identity of a Latina art therapist and artist. I'm really passionate about working and collaborating with local Latinx organizations in Chicago. And I'm really thankful that Resilience supports that um, and advocates for us to really reach out to communities that are typically underserved. Hello, um, my name is Valerie Papillon. I am a trauma therapist with Resilience. I'm a licensed clinical social worker and a certified clinical trauma professional. There's definitely a theme running here that I too came to this work as one of my mentors phrased that our life often brings us into this work out of a desire to sort of share the wisdom that I've gained through my own healing um, and wanting that to be extended to, to others. Um, I'm particularly passionate about offering therapy to marginalized folk. It's really important to me as as a, a Black woman therapist, as a, as a daughter of um, Haitian immigrants. And in my, in terms of 
other important parts of my identity and my creative identity that really merge well with my therapist identity. I'm also a, a performance artist, so I do acting, um, poetry, and singing as well. And thank you for getting this conversation started. My pleasure. Thanks for introducing yourselves. I think a good place to start in our conversation would be to talk a little bit about what sexual assault is. April is Sexual Assault Awareness Month. So in the interest of spreading awareness, let's just start talking about what what do we mean when we say sexual assault? I think, first of all, it's a public health issue and a human rights crisis and it's it's something that really demands more attention than it's given. I think it's any sexual act or an attempt of an act on an individual and the site of the trauma is the body. I'm going to just start with that and let somebody else piggyback off of that. Yeah, just adding on to what's already been said, I think it's really important to to name sort of the ways that different survivors are treated based on identity, right? And and sexual violence is a harm that can happen to any, and it happens to all identities, but a secondary trauma that happens within sexual violence is people not being believed. Thankfully, in the last few years, with the momentum of the Me Too movement, we see that particularly women survivors are finding more voice and and validation in in our society, broadly speaking, but we have so much more work to do. And especially thinking about resilience as, you know, being the city of Chicago um, and this being the city where R. Kelly was born and raised, you know, it's, it's really important to also think about the folks even within this survivor communities about how, how the community responds and who is believed and who isn't believed. Absolutely. And on that note about being believed, can you all speak to some of the misconceptions about sexual assault? Part of the many reasons why survivors aren't believed is because of just some misinformation about what sexual assault is and isn't. Can you all speak to that point a bit? I think one myth that is worth busting is that sexual assault is something that can be prevented by an individual, um, by the person who is, has uh, survived the harm. And part of why I want to bring that myth up is because the way that I tend to view sexual violence is, is almost on like a, a continuum from microaggressions that take the form of like sexual harassment or everyday breaks of boundaries and lack of consent within our social settings to a more macroaggression that comes in the form of like violence that's occurring on a higher power level of like a state violence um, against survivors when we're um, helping them to navigate different systems. We see how the systems are are not set up to protect survivors or to believe survivors. So I, I guess I, I bring up this this continuum because I I am coming from an understanding that sexual violence is a form of oppression, and when we look at other forms of oppression, we can see that this is a larger force, a larger system that is almost made physical through smaller micro acts, as Victoria was saying, the body as the site. And when we view it in this way, I think it allows us to sort of take the responsibility off of the individual and, and see the bigger picture in how sexual violence has created this rape culture where our perpetrators are protected in various ways and survivors are once again, left without very much support. So again, I think this is another wonderful reason why resilience exists. And and I'm curious to hear what others think some myths are that we could bust today. I think one thing that I would add to the to the myth busting conversation, a lot of people sort of in mainstream understanding don't are, are unfamiliar with this idea of consent being able to be retracted. Mm-hmm. That if someone has been mm-hmm. in a sexual, a consensual encounter with this person previously, that that somehow means that all following sexual, you know, encounters um, would be consensual. So consent is 
is something that is ongoing. We often say, um, you know, at, at our organization and the trainings that we do, and it can happen within the context and often does happen within the context of a romantic relationship that you're in. It can happen in marriages. Obviously, it also happens between caregivers and children. So, yeah, I would. that's what I was thinking about. Victoria, anything to add to our yeah, thing? I- I actually, not to take us off track, which I often do, <laughs> but, I, but I wanted to kind of touch base on what Lauren had just mentioned. She and I both worked in behavioral psychiatric facilities. And Lauren, when you mentioned something about like this idea that after the trauma has occurred, it's now on the survivor, right? And it is now like perpetuating the cycle of them not feeling safe within themselves, which I think is like mm-hmm. the system really failing them. You know, we both worked in facilities and folks would come in and they would get a diagnosis and they would be put on medication. And I'm definitely like pro medication when it's necessary because it truly can stabilize somebody. But I would notice, you know, individuals disclosing that they had experienced a sexual violence either in their childhood or adulthood. And I really noticed how the medical field was missing the big picture about supporting these individuals, you know, they were treating what they were seeing and just the symptoms, but we weren't addressing or they weren't addressing like the trauma history, which really then, you know, has individuals again, not feeling safe within themselves and admitting themselves to the hospital and the, like the trauma isn't addressed. So to kind of bring us back on track, you know, I think, I think that sometimes a really big issue is we kind of want a quick fix to trauma. And I also think that, I think we often have like a tendency in our society to label individuals. Victoria, thank you for naming the like feedback loop that can occur. Um, I mm-hmm. think that for sure sex- sexual violence is a self-perpetuating instance when we look at the larger framework of how mm-hmm. it even comes in when we look at like power and control and how that manifests these violent acts. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that that's why it's so important for us to to again remember that sexual violence isn't something that can be solved on that individual level, but rather it it requires a larger community movement, a larger, I would hope, even global movement towards awareness, which is exactly why we have Sexual Assault Awareness Month. And then beyond awareness, there there does need to be action and there does need to be change. So I, I think that if we can have that dual attention to both the the individual level of healing as well as our our maybe larger level of healing that's where we can find the ability to to talk about like what impacts and what changes can be made i think what what lauren is getting at it reminds me of a quote that i hear from my mentor often of you know trauma happens within relationship and therefore also has to healed within the context of relationships and 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 that can mean therapist client that could mean family you know survivor that could mean lots of different things and the other thing just going back to like some of the myths and you know talking about some of the things on um if we're thinking about a continuum the maybe the left side of the continuum but like cat calling and Um, lots of misconceptions of like what folks are wearing and that sort of inviting sexual comments um, that are unwanted. And and again, because I'm also come from a social work background. So we often think of things within a structural context and, you know, I really see survivors and and victims being blamed um, for what they're wearing and, and somehow again, projecting secondary trauma on them because of that. What you're all kind of bringing me to, I think, is this idea that sexual violence impacts not only the individual who is experiencing it, but the entire community that that individual is a part of. And then also we can take it a step further and say that we all live within a rape culture that perpetrates these aggressions on a micro and macro level. And that impacts all of us. Can you all speak more specifically to the impact that sexual violence has at the individual level and at the community level? I would start by just saying on the individual level, this rape culture as a female identifying individual, just even thinking about 
you know, the social constructs of like how we were raised, that when we were younger, we were told, you know, what to wear and how to protect ourselves and how to keep ourselves safe. There's a big gap in what's told to females and males growing up. I'm even thinking just like as a Latina, we were told to like obey our elders and like never question them. And like that really puts a lot of young individuals in like an unsafe position. So it's almost like there was too much being told to protect ourselves and then sometimes like a lack of protection. As a community, I would say it affects us profoundly. There's fear. And I think as a community organization, we try to not view perpetrators as scary monsters. I'm thinking about this idea of accountability, uh, Mm -hmm. which way too few survivors get. Um, Most survivors don't get real transformative accountability. So I think what it communicates to someone is like your pain and the harm you experience is not important. And I think about some of these more public cases like Anita Hill or Dr. Chrissy Lacey Ford, like even in these positions with these women of power and how they were silenced and this profound lack of uh, a real reckoning with the harm they experienced and sort of the the psychological violence that happened and happens um, because it's ongoing. And then I think about so many of the victims of survivors of R. Kelly, right? Many of these Women were vulnerable financially and just how profound it is to me that for years, right, you know, as someone who was raised in the suburbs of Chicago, I remember somebody inviting me to an R. Kelly party, right? And so just thinking about now as, you know, in my being in my early 30s, how we're only beginning to even name this catastrophic harm that has been systematically happening through one artist. It's profound, right? So those are some of the communal aspects. But then also, I think ultimately going back to the body, it renders the body not being a safe place, like your own body. So there's a disconnection that happens. And within the healing process, it's critical to rebuild safety and to reconnect with your body to find it to be a safe place. Yeah, thank you, Valerie. A thought came to me as you were speaking about how I think one of the major impacts of how sexual violence is treated right now in our world is like there's this this aspect of silencing and and through silencing voices, there's a normalization of the fear that Victoria mentioned. Normalizing that no one has like this the human right to safety or security, not only in their communities, but in their own bodies. So a lot of survivors will come to, through chronic re-experiencing of their trauma, um, come to internalize different voices that they've heard um, in the community. So on a community level, if we're hearing that there's no value in sharing your story, then you're going to then internalize that for yourself, potentially. Without some support, you could find yourself internalizing that. And I think if we think about it from a human rights perspective, everyone does deserve to feel a relative amount of safety in their own bodies. Our bodies are what we have as a resource. And through experiences of trauma and violence, there's an inevitable fragmentation that comes from that relationship with your body. Because as we've been talking about, the body is the site of that trauma where all of your understanding of control and and security is taken from you. I mention this because I think when we can look at how this is happening on that body-based level, we can we can almost see that be almost a microcosm for what's happening on a societal level. Between relationships, there's there's now new breaks um, where where one relationship may have felt safe because of whatever messages are coming from that person. Maybe this this relationship doesn't feel safe anymore because the survivor doesn't feel believed or heard or understood. And then again, on a community level, we can see how that can definitely have, again, one of these self-perpetuating loops of continued disruption between how we would prefer to be communicating with each other as 
as humans needing each other where where there are needs. So I, I know I, I sort of just talked myself into the circle. So I'm curious if that has um, inspired any other thoughts from anyone else. I'm thinking about what you said, Lauren, and also what Valerie was touching on a little bit earlier about how these traumas are relational traumas. They happen in relationship, I think is what Valerie was quoting before, and how um, a number of professionals, I think, refer to trauma in general as a disconnection from self. And that has all kinds of consequences, I guess, to be disconnected from yourself. Do you all have thoughts around that point or that piece? Actually, yes. That just reminded me that we're having this conversation in a really disembodied way right now because of <laughs> the impact of the pandemic that we're in. So I'm, I'm also just thinking about how in some ways when we're in this like state of disconnection, we have to be really creative about how to then reformulate that connection. I think that sort of like brings us back to where our conversation is in terms of utilizing creativity as a pathway into reintegration mm -hmm. of that, that body-mind split that maybe occurs through violence and through survival. We need dissociation to be able to survive at times, and and there. There is no shame in having dissociated in order to survive. What comes later is how do we repair that? How do we come back into ourselves? How do we remind ourselves that we are worthy and we, we do deserve to, to feel secure in our own bodies again? Yeah. Can you all speak to the way that creativity or creative process can assist in facilitating that integration? Yes. Yeah. So... It's been interesting for my own clinical work because I was trained as a talk therapist. And I think the more that I learn about trauma work and the more experience I gain, I am recognizing the limitations of pure talk therapy. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, when you think about like, the part of our brain that we use for language processing, evolutionarily speaking, like it's a very new part of the brain and it's a very sophisticated function. And so what I found, you know, as I incorporate more creative practices within my work and just being more creative, like as an artist myself, I, I find that there's so much rich opportunity there to access healing in ways that are easier, it's just freaking awesome. I'll speak for myself. When I'm singing, nothing makes me feel the way that I feel when I'm singing. When I'm acting, nothing makes me feel like that. And I don't understand fully what's happening neurobiologically there, but I know it's a different kind of empowerment and it feels more accessible to me than sometimes journaling does. Because oftentimes when we're able to put things into words, a lot of regulation has had to have happened already. And that's like a different part of our brain. That, yeah, that's on the left side of the brain that we're operating from. And there's just limitations to that, especially when you are trying to find words and, and name what you're experiencing like put words to it, what you have experienced that has been wordless. With that wordless theme, I often think about the conversations I have with my clients about as humans, we're constantly searching for meaning and to make meaning making decisions and an act so violent, like a sexual violence, it like doesn't make sense, mm -hmm. right? So it's like not deserved. You didn't do anything. It's not your fault. So I think often for for me and in the work I do as an art therapist, I think the creative process is so crucial because it allows you to process, you know, themes of pain and shame and guilt and anger and fear. And it's all nonverbal and it's hard to name it when it's sitting inside of you and in your body, since that is the site of the trauma. I think going back to what Valerie was saying, I think making and creating and processing, whether that is singing or dancing or art in whatever type of form, really allows an individual to reclaim themselves and their selfhood. 
I, I know that I kind of stumbled into resilience aside from like fangirling the organization when I was in grad school. Um, I did a project where I painted survivors story onto their bodies and the act of deciding that this violent occurrence in your life and this trauma didn't stop your story is really sacred and really powerful. I don't know. I often think that when my clients are creating, they're also allowing themselves the space to be really vulnerable and sit with their emotions in a way that feels so supported and so safe. I don't know. I think art is magic <laughs> and it's sacred and making in, in the presence of somebody while they're processing what's inside of them is so special. And Victoria, I think your body painting project, which is called Healing Embodied, by the way, is a particularly strong example of that theme or concept of integration because Mm -hmm. it was sort of a, a hybrid process of engaging with body and also images. So can you speak to that piece of it a little bit? Sure. The Healing and Body Project was done with Jordan, Beth Enterkin, and Brendan Eukins. And we really began by inviting survivors to think about what part of their story they wanted to share with others. It could be, I want to represent where I was when the trauma occurred. I want to be right now fully present, which I think was really important to give folks that autonomy. And then after folks decided to write down what they wanted to share, we decided what their healing looked like at this moment or what it looked like in the past. And everybody's imagery was so different. Some folks talked about reclaiming their body and used really vivid images. Some folks were like, I want to focus on how my chakras have been affected by this trauma. There was so much trust and so much safety that had to exist for this to occur. And it was really rewriting the narrative that nudity has to be sexual. And it was like, I'm naked and I'm telling my story and I can be naked in the presence of others and it can be safe, which is how it should be, right? There was so much revival that existed in this and community and support and pride. I know, Jordan, you were a part of it too, if you want to do you want to share? I think it was really powerful. I think there was there were also movement and performance components to the piece too, because it was really there was just a lot of power in the process of the painting happening, um, and everyone kind of set it up the way that they wanted to with music or certain positions that they put their body into. And I think it I think it was sort of a process of making things that were implicit, explicit. And it all kind of culminated in a, a photography show of the of the end products. Um, so there was another layer of exhibition as a healing process as well, and as a kind of a platform to be witnessed in this way. Mm-hmm. Um, which kind of comes back to that piece around silencing. And this was sort of the opposite of that. Lauren, what's your perspective on integrating creative process and what you do with survivors? Yeah, so um, thank you for sharing about that project. I am really hopeful that we can try it again. So if anyone who's listening to this and is interested, you know, feel free to reach out and let us know how you can support us. But in terms of my own um, understanding of creative process and healing, I actually think that it's the way in, especially with trauma, and and I'll give you an understanding as to why I feel that trauma is something that creates so much uncertainty and unknown because, like we were talking about, it sort of de-identify yourself. It's possible that that can happen. And when we're in this place of the unknown, it can either be extremely fearful or we can shift it into curiosity. And I think that that's the place where creativity comes in. When we shift into curiosity, creativity is almost like this emergent potential of the unknown. And it's it's almost like making the uncertain become something that we can play with. There's an element of imagination, I think, when we look at healing in a creative process. And it provides that alternative way into making meaning, where it doesn't necessarily come from the top down, like Valerie was talking about with talk therapy. We're not saying how we feel and then naming it, but rather we're feeling first. It's a bottom-up process where we allow ourselves the space and the time to honor 
what it is that's already happening, and then we can we can use that to transform it or to to even just be with it and sit alongside it, befriend it. And and I think that this is so beautiful because it also creativity allows the nonlinear way of being with our brains and with our bodies and our our expression, which is so necessary that we know, I'm sure that other therapists who are listening know that the healing process is is nonlinear. That's how the brain is encoding something during times of trauma. It's going to encode it in this fragmented way. So of course we have to sort of meet the trauma where it's at Mm -hmm. (laughs) and and come in with this nonlinear perspective. And again, I feel like creativity is something that allows us to create space for that. And and as you were saying that violence happens on this implicit level, I think there's an aspect of creativity that is implicit and intuitive also, where sometimes we don't necessarily need to have the answers. And it, it again, is almost like a, a way where we can begin to trust our intuition and trust that we already have the answers within us. It's a matter of opening ourselves up to listening to those answers. Yes to everything that's been said, but I did just want to clarify a little bit for our listeners. Talk therapy is very effective and I want to reframe it a little bit. Good talk therapy should not be top down or it's it's useful. What I was trying to say that I think there's a lot of untapped opportunity within the creative practice because it is such an intuitive process as what like Lauren was speaking to. But, you know, as our society shifts more into like meditation and mindfulness, which is a whole different conversation that I don't want to go down that rabbit hole, but I think quieting down our minds so that our natural wisdom can come to the surface. That That is sort of what I see structurally as what happens often within the creative process and what happens in the therapeutic process, even, even if it is just talk therapy. Talking can certainly be obviously what somebody needs in that moment. So yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad you said that too. And, and to your point, Valerie, creative process isn't only alive during art making. You know, I think it's something that can be present with us and integrated into conversations as well. Like, I think there's a lot of creativity that happens in sessions with my clients when we're just talking to each other. So I don't think uh, I agree with exactly what you said. And I also just wanted to add that creative process isn't limited to actually producing something or, in, you know, or engaging in an art practice. Yes, I yes, love that. To that, mm-hmm. I also would love to name that there are other forms under the creative arts therapy umbrella, including poetry therapy and yes. music therapy. Both of those forms utilize language and language as a creative process. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that that, again, speaks to the fact that creative process is, again, about meaning-making, And meaning-making can be done through whatever medium you feel called to make meaning through. So whether that's writing or singing or being, there's so much creative potential in in everything. But I do agree that it does require that space first and that quiet mind so that the emergence has space to actually flow into the, the area that you've created for it. Yeah. I want to also return to, you mentioned briefly, Lauren, something about imagination. And I wanted to come back to that because I think that is uh, specifically relevant to folks who are recovering from trauma because it is um, a function of our mind that tends to go offline when we're in crisis or when we are traumatized. And it's such an important thing that our brains do is to imagine because that's where change happens. That's where progress happens. That's where hope lives, I think. And I think those things are really vital to any healing process. And so I just wanted to bring us back to that point around imagining. And that can happen in so many different ways. Have you all seen that come alive in some of your work with your clients? Yes, totally. Yeah, I'm just so grateful for this conversation. I love how we're nerding out right now. 
when it, one question I've been inviting my clients to reflect on, if it's useful for them recently, is imagining the flip side to whatever anxiety is is grappling them at that moment. So like it might look like, okay, well, what, what if you were able to learn how to trust yourself? What if you were able to build that confidence? What would that feel like? What, what would you be doing? And, and to me, that really is an invitation to sort of imagining and, and beginning to empower them to rewrite their story and rewrite their relationship with themselves. Yeah. I think that I have asked very similar questions to my clients. What do you guys think, Victoria and Lauren? Absolutely. I think at the root of imagination, right, it's curiosity Mm -hmm. and engaging with these really big emotions in a way that feels manageable. I know like even just, okay, so we're sitting in the room together and let's talk about that that shame that you have buried away. Can, can we sit with it right now? And what does it look like? And what does it say to you? And how do you respond back to it? And, and whose voice is it? So I think, you know, we have to, we have to imagine and, and go there to that really creative place. I think is a way that I've done with my clients, Lauren, what about you? So recently I've been working with Amber Gray, who is a dance movement therapist but uses polyvagal informed dance movement therapy. And this is coming from a theory of Stephen Porges. And she offered a an idea that I'm like really running with right now. And it's that imagination is a portal and it's it's a bridge that's created between body and memory. And I think that that's so beautiful to work with with survivors like because yeah, um, it, it just offers such an understanding that as we begin to vision what it is that we can create for ourselves, we can then manifest into that. Obviously, it's going to take time and work and effort, and it's going to take time to be with our inner children and to support and comfort them as they start to come up because with change we need to also then invite ease and invite regulation as we change because change can have that double-edged sword where it can both be really exciting and new, but also really overwhelming. So as we are able to begin breaking patterns that maybe were serving us during times of survival, and we, we break out of those patterns to create new patterns of restoration and love and self-compassion and courage, I think that we're sowing seeds and planting seeds so that out of the crisis can come creativity. Yes, I just have to virtually give the raise the roof to that because I think that so many people underestimate the role that inviting ease, inviting that self-compassion that grace and that radical self-acceptance that is so critical. And I think a a precursor to the process of transformation and healing, like it it has to be incorporated into it. And like in a society and in a world that says like, we have to be productive all the time and for our value, I think it's a really misunderstood and underutilized aspect of the healing process. I agree. And it, and I think also it's a difficult process for a lot of folks because I think in order to have acceptance for ourselves and self-compassion, we have to know what that feels like. And oftentimes we get that from others first. And I've had a number of clients who have never or very rarely felt acceptance and compassion from others. And so It's a really kind of tall order to invite folks to practice that for themselves. And I think that's where the creativity and the the imagination or the, yeah, the imagination kind of space really helps facilitate that practice for folks. Yep, definitely. As we're kind of thinking and talking about creativity and imagination and these tools and skills that we hope to empower our clients with. Are there any specific practices you'd like to offer people who are listening that they can practice on their own, in their home, during this time of physical distancing? 
I would love to offer the practice of being present with yourself. I think that because we we don't really have access to relating externally, this does offer us an opportunity to relate to ourselves internally. And, and one way that you could do this is by listening to your own body. So I don't know if any of you have had any experiences or practices with breathing, but breath in many, many, many cultures is so closely related to the spirit. And even if you just think about language, there are many languages that call breath an inspiration. And I think that that is so much tied to our creativity because as we breathe, we are creating our own oxygenation into our lungs, into our heart, into our mind. So even the act of taking a breath is a creative act. Mm -hmm. And from that breath, we can try listening in and even trusting your impulses. So by then taking a step back into ourselves, we can create space for what needs to arise out of us and what can unfold. And that could be something as simple as, well, I need to stretch my arm right now. And that is a creative act. Using our bodies as a resource can be such a grounding experience in this time of uncertainty. I also would love to just name that nature can help to guide us and it can be a teacher to us right now. Maybe trying movements in response to what you can see out of your window or moving in response to a house plant you have at home. These are all creative acts that can serve us in these times. That's awesome. Thank you, Lauren. And following that, I would also encourage folks to just have fun. I think finding some sort of playful energy in art making is so important. I know it's scary what's happening right now in our world and, you know, we're all experiencing a collective trauma. But if there's anything I would say is just enjoying and being curious with the material, having fun with watercolors or having fun with clay or like putty Sometimes I think we put a lot of pressure on ourselves that when you have material, it has to be art, right? And fine art. And like, who is an artist and who gets to decide that? And I know Valerie and I have had this conversation together about everybody's an artist and art can look messy and playful. And at the end, the end product, maybe that's not what the point of the art making was. It was just the making. So that's what I would say to folks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love those. I would invite folks to color. Like if you have a coloring book or if you want to create, like if you have just a blank piece of paper and and you want to just create sort of your own coloring page, like something abstract, coloring can be very regulating for a lot of people. Two other things I was going to offer, very much in line with what, what Lauren has offered really figuring out what circumstances you need to begin to listen to your bodies. I've been asking myself and my clients often lately, what does your body need right now? Do you need to drink water? Do you need to stretch? Do you need food? And kind of along with what like Victoria was inviting us to do, but like having fun. So like putting on a song that makes you feel good and then watch, watch sort of where your body naturally leads you what does your body want to do what sort of feelings does that evoke in you yeah I think too to your point around coloring and Victoria yours about just engaging it with materials like art materials Mm -hmm. there's a lot of positive benefit to engaging in repetitive movements in art making It's a way to soothe yourself. It helps release serotonin in our brains, which makes us feel good. So anything like stitching or knitting or coloring or anything that um, invites a repetitive motion in your body while engaging with art materials can feel so helpful and so regulating and grounding and soothing for folks right now. So I just wanted to, to kind of add that piece to it as well. 
I would Thank also, you, Jordan. yeah, Jordan, with the repetitive movement, mm-hmm. I just thought of like cooking, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm glad you mentioned that. And yeah. I would just like to add that we can be the predictability that we need for ourselves through these acts of ritualization and re- repetition. If maybe you can find a way to make something a routine for yourself, something that feels really soothing, if you can try that like every morning at a specific time, then you can create your own sense of predictability to help sort of balance out the incredible amount of uncertainty that we feel. And that can really help to regulate your nervous system. And again, it is still a creative act in doing that for yourself. So I just wanted to name that ritual can be incredibly grounding during these times too. Yeah. Thank you. So we're kind of coming to a close on our conversation today. Are there any final thoughts or words of encouragement or anything you'd like to say as we close up today? However you're feeling right now, there's no right or wrong way to feel. And we believe you. Be really gentle with yourself and to listen to what your body is asking of you. Seek support from the people in your life that will listen and hold space for you. When you're ready, therapy is an option. When you find a therapist, if that feels like something that's aligned with you, find somebody that values your story and knows that it's sacred and that your healing process is typically not smooth and and fast. It's usually slow and kind of messy, but revival and healing is possible. I love that. Yeah, I just want to extend lots of virtual love and invite folks to just be very tender with yourselves and very patient with yourselves. And I think you can always probably trust yourself more than you think you can. So just really want to like plant those seeds. That feeling is now linear. It's an ongoing journey. Like we are going to need to heal for the rest of our lives and that's okay. Lauren, any final thoughts or words to offer people? You know, I I am sort of rendered speechless in this moment and I'm I'm just going to honor that right now I, I'm feeling my heart beat. Mm. And then I'm and living. Then I'm being. Okay. And I am here in gratitude. So thank you. Okay. Thank I love you. that. Yeah. Well, thank you all for talking with me and um, for sharing your expertise and your ideas around this topic. I really enjoyed hearing what you have to say. I hope it is useful for people who are listening. And if anybody who is listening is looking for additional support during this time, Resilience is offering uh, one-time sessions free of charge. They'll be hosted over the phone and they'll be with a trauma therapist. You can find a form on the homepage of our website, which again is ourresilience.org, to access this option. And of course, there's also the Rape Crisis Hotline number that you can call 24-7, and that is 888-293-2080. And I just want to thank you guys again for participating, and thanks for anybody who's listening for listening.